At present, those that govern, induced by the motives which I have named, treat their subjects badly, while they and their adherents, especially the young men of the governing class, are habituated to lead a life of luxury and idleness, both of body and mind. They do nothing and are incapable of resisting either pleasure or pain. Very true. They themselves care only for making money and are as indifferent as the pauper to the cultivation of virtue. Yes, quite as indifferent. Such is the state of affairs which prevails among them, and often rulers and their subjects may come in one another's way, whether on a journey or on some other occasion of meeting, on a pilgrimage or a march, as fellow soldiers or fellow sailors, and they may observe the behaviour of each other in the very moment of danger. For where danger is, there is no fear that the poor will be despised by the rich, and very likely the wiry, sunburned poor man may be placed in battle at the side of a wealthy one who has never spoiled his complexion and has plenty of superfluous flesh. When he sees such a one puffing and at his wit's end, how can he avoid drawing the conclusion that men like him are only rich because no one has had the courage to despoil them? And when they meet in private, will not people be saying to one another, our warriors are not good for much? Yes, I'm quite aware that this is their way of talking. Just as a sickly body needs only a slight push from the outside to become ill, and sometimes even without any external influence becomes divided by factions within itself, so too doesn't a city that is in the same condition as that body, on a small pretext, uh, men brought in as allies from outside, from a city under an oligarchy by the members of one party, and from a city under a democracy by the members of the other, fall sick and do battle with itself, and sometimes, even without any external influence at all, become divided by faction? Yes, surely. And then democracy comes into being after the poor have conquered their opponents, slaughtering some, bashing some, while to the remainder they give an equal share of freedom and power. And this is the form of government in which the magistrates are commonly elected by lot. Yes, that is the nature of democracy whether the revolution has been effected by arms or whether fear has caused the opposite party to withdraw. And now, what is their manner of life and what sort of government have they? For as the government is, such will be the man. Clearly. In the first place, are they not free? And is not the city full of freedom and frankness? A man may say and do what he likes. To said so. And where freedom is, the individual is clearly able to order for himself his own life as he pleases. Clearly. Then in this kind of state there will be the greatest variety of human natures. There will. This, then, seems likely to be the fairest of states, being like an embroidered robe which is spangled with every sort of flower. And just as women and children think a variety of colours of all things most charming, so there are many men to whom this state, which is spangled with the manners and characters of mankind, will appear to be the fairest of states. Yes. Yes, my good sir, and there will be no better in which to look for a government. Why? Why, because of the liberty which reigns there. They have a complete assortment of constitutions, and he who has a mind to establish a state, as we have been doing, must go to a democracy as he would to a bazaar at which they sell them, and pick out the one that suits him. Then, when he has made his choice, he may found a state. He will be sure to have patents enough, and there be no necessity for you to govern in this state, even if you have the capacity, or to be governed unless you like, or to go to war when the rest go to war, or to be at peace when others are at peace, unless you are so disposed. There be no necessity also, because some law forbids you to hold office or be a die-cast, that you should not hold office or be a die-cast if you have a fancy. Is not this a way of life which for the moment is supremely delightful? For the moment, yes. And is not their humanity to the condemned, in some cases quite charming? 
Have you not observed how in a democracy many persons, although they have been sentenced to death or exile, just stay where they are and walk about the world? The gentleman parades like a hero and nobody sees or cares. Yes, many and many a one. See too the forgiving nature of democracy and the don't care about trifles and the disregard which it shows of all the fine principles which we solemnly laid down at the foundation of the city. As when we said that, except in the case of some rarely gifted nature, there never will be a good man who has not from his childhood been used to play amid things of beauty and make of them a joy and a study. How grandly does she trample all these fine notions of ours under her feet, never giving a thought to the pursuits which make a statesman, and promoting to honour anyone who professes to be the people's friend. Yes, she's of noble spirit. These and other kindred characteristics are proper to democracy, which is a charming form of government, full of variety and disorder, and dispensing a sort of equality to equals and unequals alike.